for chemistry. And I will give this wonderful book. Uh, cultural chemistry, simple strategies for bridging cultural gaps. Patty is also a qualified life coach and NLP master, accredited global disc practitioner and certified in a migrant experience at the age of eight when she moved from England to Belgium. And she also lived in many other countries in the USA. So what we're going to discuss today is more integration and less differentiation. Betty, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And hi, everybody. Let's get this started. Okay. So yeah, as you know, this is this is the topic, and um, <laughs> some of you might have read in the blurb that I felt I had a a life determining experience at the age of eight, and you might have been wondering what that could have been. And it was my first international move from England to Belgium, and I went to the um, American International School, and. Um, International days, uh, international schools are in many ways much more modern nowadays than they were. But I, I think, you know, when I was a kid, they were very much American schools in, in international destinations. So, and I'd been at this school for about three weeks and I came back from lunch one day and all the desks were moved into a big square, apart from one desk that was on its own. And this nasty little American girl said to me, you can't sit with us because you don't sound like us. Next day, I came in saying, hi, how is everybody? And basically that, that sort of monster in me grew, grew wings. And years later, then when we moved to the States, I literally would be this sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I would be talking to my mother in my English accent and then the phone would ring and I'd be like oh hi hi Julie how are you sure I'll ask mom mom can I get to Julie's at the weekend oh sure Julie mom says yes and what I learned there is to be a cultural chameleon basically to to change my ways to fit in to blend in to take the path of least resistance often and I wouldn't wholeheartedly agree with that now, because actually, I think from a point from a diversity perspective, you know, we, we lose a lot when we encourage people to to just dump everything that makes them different and, and just try to have their focus on belonging. But I wanted to talk today about this topic of how we can actually kind of have the best of, of both worlds. So and my interested in in this topic is both from a personal and a sort of professional point of view so you'll remember back on February 24th 2022 that Russia invaded Ukraine and obviously the world was aghast and everybody well not everybody but a lot of people thought well what can I do how can I help so my response my war effort, if you like, was to start trying to find hosts for Ukrainian refugees who were looking for hosts in the UK. So I became a sort of matchmaker. And on the right there, you can see that's my, my spreadsheet. <laughs> I'm, I'm old school. I like pen and paper. And so my, my green were hosts. My pinks were Ukrainian people looking for hosts and the yellows were matches. And I had this huge board, much, much bigger than this. This is just a bit of it um, that allowed me to sort of match people up. And, and I was a, a dating site, if you like. You know, I, I, I took the trouble to talk to people who were looking to host and looking to be hosted to find out what they wanted and, and hopefully sort of make a good fit for both of them. And I ended up finding homes for 152 refugees, um, working with 67 hosts 
UK wide. So all over started off being sort of just around Oxfordshire where I live. Um, and then it just expanded because basically people would say, you know, to their sister who lived in Scotland, oh, I'm doing this and I'm working with this woman. So so, so that, that was great. Um, I also, we hosted two um, different sets of Ukrainian refugees ourselves and initially a young couple and then later a mother and a daughter. And uh, Christmas last year, we had a, a big Christmas dinner for Ukrainian people living in our in our village. So I also drove to um, to Poland and took out a load of supplies. So I went with a group. We were um, eight minibuses in convoy, and uh, we drove pretty much nonstop for 24 hours, um, two hours on, two hours off. We took supplies to a distribution center in, in Poland and uh, we brought back people from Ukraine who were look, who were trying to get to England and often couldn't because they were bringing, usually because they were bringing pets. So in, my, in my van, we had, a, we had a lizard and a cat um, and there were different animals in each van. So, uh, so I'd say I sort of got fairly immersed in the whole attempt to, to rescue Ukrainians and to do what I could. And about a year on, I, well, I'd stayed in touch with all my hosts. I had a, a WhatsApp group called Patty's Hosts and then another one where I could have had all the guests so that they could connect with each other. And I would host a monthly Zoom chat with all my hosts so that if anybody was having problems or concerns, they could they could join and just share the collective wisdom. And, and it got me sort of thinking for this talk about, you know, what, what did happen to all those? And, and I'd say some of them worked out brilliantly. Some of them, people were so happy together. Other people, it was okay. It was tolerable. And some people, it was just an absolute disaster. And it had been from the beginning. And so I started to think about, well, the ones that didn't work what what did they have in common what did they not have the ones that did work you know what what made that difference and and I'd say about half of them failed to to, to integrate right and the official the the dictionary meaning of integration is to is bringing together parts to to make up a whole it's combining it's sort of adding a left half of a pair of scissors and a right half of a pair of scissors and, and making a pair of scissors. So, and it's incorporating groups into a community. But actually, in many ways, it's the opposite of what integrate means that was concerning me, because the opposite is to be segregated, to be isolated, to be unconnected, and to be quarantined. And none of those were positive experiences for people. So I started asking, well, you know, why did some fail and, and some succeeded? And I, I put together this, this list, which top of which definitely was unrealistic expectations on, on both sides. And in, in many ways, it wasn't surprising that many of the Ukrainian guests had unrealistic expectations because they quite possibly did not know very much about the UK before they came. It's not like they had a choice. They needed to get out. They wanted to get out quickly. So, so my kind of a, attempts at matchmaking had, had tried to reduce these risks. Um, but nevertheless, people came with unrealistic expectations of what it would be like here. Um, and I think a lot of the hosts had very unrealistic expectations and really had a bit of a sort of a savior mentality and we're expecting their guests to be really grateful and happy to be in England and not really taking into account all the difficulties that people had gone through. So on both sides, there was a lack of, of preparation and a lack of knowledge about each other. There was obviously the impact of trauma and some of the, the, the situations that many of the Ukrainian people had been through, you know, were, were terrible. And you had hosts in England who had no experience of dealing with people like that, who were just trying to kind of tiptoe their way through this difficult situation. On both sides, there were poor language skills. Um, certainly the English people found Ukrainian really difficult to master. 
and there probably was an expectation that the Ukrainians were the ones who needed to do all the work anyway um, in order to fit in. So uh, I think a lot of older Ukrainians, and by that, honestly, I mean over 30, found it really hard to learn English. And certainly one of my guests, a woman of 49, she would sit for hours every day with, with vocabulary lists and it, it just didn't go in. So uh, I think both sides, there was a lack of flexibility. Uh, the hosts saying, right, I've done, I've got this room for you and this is where you're going to be and this is what you're going to do. And, and there was a, a failure to really acknowledge that a lot of the time, these were adults who were being moved without their consent and having to put adults to, to live together who didn't actually necessarily want to be together, there was bound to be strife and resistance. And I think a lot of people just didn't ex expect that and they didn't really know how to manage it when it happened. And of course, you know, in the end, there's, there's human nature. Some people were just very difficult to live with and, you know, we get that in, in all situations. And honestly, this sounded so familiar to me of what I had done in my professional capacity as an expat coach and trainer and trying to manage some of these differences. So we all know as interculturalists that without research, you get all sorts of sometimes, you know, to us funny, but, you know, also completely cringe experiences where, um, so for example, at the bottom here, we've got Justin Trudeau on her a visit to India where he and his family marched around the whole time dressed up in in Indian clothing much to the confusion and also hilarity of the Indian public that he met with who were all wearing western clothes and wondering you know was this sort of cultural appropriation gone completely mad uh, some of you might know this video um, if you don't I recommend that you look at it it's called um, what kind of Asian are you? And um, it's an American Korean girl out for a run. And, you know, this guy says, oh, you know, you speak great English. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm from, you know, Santa Barbara or whatever. And, and, and you know, but my parents were Korean. And he's like, oh, Korean. I really love kimchi. And, you know, it's that bringing it down to that really sort of bottom level is just, well, for us in our industry, you know, just so cringe. You get product names like this shito for some sort of pickle in in Nigeria, and you get this check in your pocket I picked up last year, and it's got phrases like, Miss, you have beautiful eyes, and oh, you can give the bill to the man, or you know, I can't, I can't remember what it is, but you know, we, we get these, you know, oh no, hideous sort of moments, and but hopefully they're a bit funny as well. But, you know, more seriously, we get all these business missed chances, the lost business opportunities and, and sales where we try to sell to somebody in the way that we like to sell, not the way that they like to buy. We fail to deepen personal connections because we're not able to build rapport with them. We don't share ideas with them because for whatever reason, somebody is resistant to our way of doing things that perhaps we are taking a very individualistic approach to how we want to do things. And they are a very collective group of people who actually don't want to do it that way at all. So then we get this communication breakdown, whether through language or literally through all the, the un vocalized communication the the eye contact the the personal distance the the use of silence to say something many different ways in which we communicate and in which we can miss each other and all of which leading to employee engagement levels plummeting and people just feeling like they aren't interested they're not prepared to go the extra mile so huge wastes of, of everybody's money and, and time. And, you know, we all know this. So, so my question for you, but not yet, <laughs> is, is how can we move the focus of cultural training to be more about integration and less about differentiation? But before we do that, I, I want to tell you what I think is the problem with a lot of cultural training today. And, uh, and what I have done to try to address this. Um, and then of course, I, I want to hear from you. So 
First of all, for me, is the fact that cultural training isn't mandatory. And this quote from Steve Jobs, a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. If you replace that with need, a lot of times people don't know what they need until you show it to them. It's exactly what we do. And people don't know what they don't know. And so often I find that, that, that you know, that I get a phone call saying, you know, basically the, the bleeps hit the fan. Can you come in and help us? It, we do a lot more reparation when we should be doing a lot more preparation. And just as, a, as an example of this, I, I had a call a few years ago from an HR manager saying, uh, can you come in and help us? Um, we have a, a Japanese managing director and he's joined our team and um, he's been here for about 15 months now and basically all hell is about to sort of break loose. So, so I went in and um, sort of basically there were two groups of people. There was one man and another group, his, his executive leadership team, who just really were not understanding each other at all. And there were many things that they didn't understand about. But one which has stuck with me, which was that Mickey said to me when I asked my sales manager if his wife could perhaps take my wife out for lunch because my wife was lonely Mickey um Kevin had said oh that'll cost you and Mickey said you know people were so unfriendly and unwilling to help and and even my sales manager said I had to pay for his wife to help my wife and I was just like oh no it's just not that at all you know Kevin was from Yorkshire and he had that sort of gruff sense of humor that some of you might know and is oh that'll cost you he didn't mean that mickey had to pay for it but that's what mickey heard and that's the interpretation that mickey put on it and then everything else was colored by the interpretation of that i mean if it's something so personal that you're asking your colleague to help you with your with your unhappy wife and then that's the response that you get so it colored everything. So there was just misunderstanding all around. And, and, and what I did was work with, with all of them. And, you know, they lived happily ever after. But it, they were such a classic of not knowing that they needed to have some help with integrating two people from, or two groups of people from very different backgrounds. And if it had been mandatory, then that would have at least solved some of the problem. I think a lot of training focuses on what is different and what is not the same. And I think, you know, we, we are moving on as a, as a profession from these kind of Hofstadter, um, Trompenars, you know, oh, you score, you know, 16 and they score 80. So look out, you know, there's going to be a big problem there. But still, a lot of my clients, this is their understanding of what cultural training is about. This is what they ask for. You know, can you talk about the iceberg of culture and can you give us comparisons? So like a laundry list of, of you know, you must do this and you mustn't do that. And, you know, that is what they asked me for, even though personally, you know, it, it, it's not the, the approach that I recommend. So um, next um, is it, it focuses a lot of the folks, it, it focuses on learning about the other and ignores the need for self-awareness. So that is in itself, I think, you know, really, really dangerous. So it's all that one person learning about the other and forgets the need for um, people being aware of their own culture, their own cultural differences and how people might perceive them because of the way that they do things. So this idea of actually holding up a mirror to yourself and knowing what you look like and how you might come across to other people is something that, again, is not ever asked for. And people are surprised when I say, well, before we talk about them, we're going to talk about you and how you do things and what things there are about you that might surprise other people. Number four is that a lot of training provides superficial knowledge. So I'm talking about when companies that I sometimes work for provide me with their training material. 
And, you know, back in the day when we had a week to do cultural training, we'd be telling them how many rivers there were and how long they were and how many meters the highest mountain was and all sorts of stuff to sort of fill the time. And I think there is still an emphasis on superficial knowledge on sort of, you know, etiquette issues that are outdated. So there is one that I read not that long ago, which um, rem asked me to remember to tell people that it's customary in the UK for a gentleman to remove his gloves before shaking hands. Like, really? <laughs> so, again, you know, expectations are that we will provide this sort of superficial etiquette guide rather than actually drilling down to, well, how do we actually connect with people on a personal level? Um, and lastly, I think a lot of cultural training is only training the incoming, if you like, and not the incumbents. So we get, for example, the team of people that I worked with in Australia, a young Chinese woman had been fast tracked, moved over from China to Australia, no cultural training given to her. About four months in, I was asked to go in and help her because she was not meeting expectations. And so I, I, I trained her, I helped her, but her journey would have been so much easier if her team had also had some training in how she was going to be doing things differently and actually not putting all the onus on her to make all the changes, but to be willing to adapt to the way that she also might do things differently. And that actually, if they said, anyone got any ideas and she didn't speak up straight away, it might not necessarily mean that she's got nothing to say. There might be a number of other reasons for her not contributing, like she's sort of thinking about it, like she's struggling with having English as a second language, like she hasn't understood the speed at which you are speaking in your heavy Australian accents and, you know, perhaps the sporting terminology that you used in your question. So uh, for all these reasons, I think we don't offer anything like as much value as as we as we could um and and that there is we have a, i think we have a job to do to educate our clients in what they should be asking us for and that hopefully then together we actually have lots of ways in which we can help people be more successful at integrating and 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 still acknowledging the differences hopefully celebrating those differences but at the same time allowing people to to integrate with and and to build better pro, um, personal and professional connections with their with their colleagues so my solution briefly in, in my book cultural chemistry uh because i'm a coach as well uh, i didn't want to just write a book about cultural differences and and you know oh well you know there we go i, I wanted to give people a coaching model so i call mine the four r's and the first one is rewards. So as in coaching, you start with, oh, well, what's to be gained? Why would you bother to invest your time and your money in this process? And it goes through a number of professional and personal uh, things to be gained by people. The second R is research. So what do you need to know? And that's all the stuff that we would normally impart in the, in the training. But we also add in reflect. So what about you? both how do you respond to difference we talk about unconscious bias and, and and jump into conclusions and so on but also that ability to hold a mirror up to your own cultural way of doing things and your own um things that might be difficult for other people and finally reach out so ways to connect with people thinking as this as a sort of okay this is a, a a problem that i can address different solutions to and it might be um building rapport thinking about how to get in rapport with people it might be what i call engaging your inner sherlock which is basically you know putting on your deer stalker and thinking about okay so let's look at this situation let's look at what's going on here and think about how i can address you know both the differences and build on what we have in common it's it's things like you know not not jumping to conclusions not falling back on stereotypes there's a number of different things that we can do and um 
and the way I've structured the book is to have different sections on sort of like communication and leadership and then to get people to go through the four hours at the end so and and that's now what I use in my training is this is the way that I structure all of mine and I believe that it addresses a lot of the inconsistencies that that so that no matter what people ask me for this is what they get <laughs> but but also you know, in my minibus driving back from Poland this is what we talked about you know we talked about these are the kind of things that you're going to come up against because it's so important to me to to give people realistic expectations of the situation that they're that they're going through and I do think as a profession uh, I would love to see us being if you like braver and pushing back to clients and saying, I know that's what you think you want, but actually it isn't what you need. So over to you. I hope that's given you some uh, food for thought and I know you've got loads of great ideas. So looking forward to, to hearing them. I'll stop my share. Thank you. Would you like us to go to the groups? Sure. Okay, how many groups would you like to have? We are 31 per persons. Okay, now. So we, what do you think? Five or six in each? Maybe less. <laughs> Maybe less. Okay. Well, you're the boss. Let's, let's, let's create seven groups then. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, would you like to be included into the group or you would like to stay in the main room? Uh, I will pop into each different ones if that's all right all right Maybe. all right so and how how many minutes minutes do we allocate to the back and and i know from kai that they they had a very nice discussion in their room patty the floor is yours again so just manage our discussion oh, please right okay so i don't know what you've all thought but i've come up with the answer and that's we need an instagram influencer so we need someone. And Vincent, I know you're retired now, so maybe you've got a bit of time on your hands and, you know, you, you could take on this role. So we basically need someone who is actually going to get out there every day to a follower, or, you know, a following of several million people and say, this stuff really matters and, you know, can make you happy or not. So um, anyway, I'm open to offers, but uh, um, no, in seriousness, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have. I tried to drop in on a few rooms and apologize to those who, people who I left when they were in mid flow, uh, like Mohammed. So, um, but I was just trying to sneak in and sneak out. So, um, what ideas did anyone have? Um, I think you're all muted. So if you've all got great ideas, I'm not hearing them. So. May I say something? Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, um, in the end, what Andrea and Mohammed and I were discussing is how even within a country, even within an area, everybody is a little bit different. And of course, our culture influences lots of different things about us that we're not aware of. But um you can't look at a person and think, you know, oh, they're American like I am. And people make assumptions about me that are rarely true um, anymore, especially. Um, so it's really this emphasis on really getting to know the other person as an individual and how they want to identify themselves and what yeah. their needs and, and their ways of communicating are. Yeah, it's a good point because, I mean, um, you know, the research has shown that actually economic status, profession and education are far greater indicators of the likelihood of you being able to connect than country and culture. And yet we start from this point of difference, like, oh, you're going to Poland, that's going to be so difficult because they do all these things so differently to you. But actually start off, isn't it, you know, you're an engineer and you're going to work with some other engineers. So that's great from the outset because, you know, you've got a shared interest in, blah, 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 you know, and we need, I think, you know, as I said, to, to turn it around and start from what's, what people have in common and then say, yeah, yeah there, there are going to be these challenges and here's how to cope with them. But, you know, how you respond to those is just as important. So 
Paddy, I wonder if it's, I mean, you're absolutely right. The easy place to start are the artifacts and the, the, the behaviors because they're visible, they're obvious, and we can we can look at that. But one of the things we were talking about in our room is perhaps actually things start much, much earlier than that. And it's about personal self-awareness and empathy. It's understanding where I where I come from and why I might see difference and whether seeing that difference is appropriate. But also perhaps understanding where others come from and how they may see difference, too. And if we can mm -hmm. start right the way back at that point, rather than looking at the the things you might see when you, you you land in the airport and things like that. I wonder whether that helping people to have that increased level of self-awareness, that increased empathy might prepare them better for integration and also to making the connections to help integrate with others too. Oh, I, I'm sure. And certainly my experience is when you start talking about people, when you talk about, stop talking about self-awareness with people, <laughs> it's like, what? You mean like it might be my fault? Because, you know, we all know the typical response to difference is to blame the other person. So absolutely, um, you start turning, you know, actually the focus is on you being more responsive. You know, yeah, brilliant. I, I just, I, I, I wonder, so how do I know that I'm well prepared for integration? Um, Thank you, Steve, for sharing the, what you have discussed. And I was when you were talking, I was just asking myself, okay, so how would I know whether I'm prepared or non prepared for, 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 for the integration? Well, my feeling is that if you have a, a modicum of, you know, in the tiniest bit of emotional intelligence, then you are aware when you are fitting in, if you are, if you like, you are aware whether people like you. Or not and and the challenge comes when people don't have any emotional acuity so I, I when I'm training I describe cultural intelligence as a combination of having the emotional acuity to notice that you're not actually all getting along and then you combine that with your knowledge of cultural difference to think I wonder if there might be some cultural issue going on here that I'm not aware of or I wonder if it might be something about my culture that is causing the problem here. And frankly, if if people don't have that emotional acuity, I think probably they're a bit for lost cause, unfortunately. You I know, mean, we can sort of, you know, we can we can save some of the people. Well, I don't, we can't maybe save all of them. So that's my feeling. What does anyone else think? Me, I would like to say, um, yeah, I would like to say that. Uh, in culture with high power distance, people might expect the refugee to adapt and them and, and think also that the only uh, way to adapt is to learn the language. So themselves have no self-awareness. And I think self-awareness is a skills that should be built at a very early stage in our multicultural societies. And I think that if you are uh, in front of uh, an educated person, mid thirties, forties, just uh, uh, being challenged that the person might be wrong, that some people in high power distance culture, they might just take it as an as an offense. They are intelligent enough to know. And so they might refuse to challenge themselves. And I think that's why also in culture that I have a low power distance, I find that the cross-cultural training are much more uh, common and uh, I think those countries have been very, uh, very early in developing cross-cultural skills. I think it has also to do with how you perceive yourself towards others. Of course, in egalitarian societies, the refugee is not less or more important than you. While if you come from a culture with high power distance, you expect people to adjust and not the other way around. Yeah, it's really interesting point. Very interesting point. Yeah, and I also see that Cordula has made several points in the chat, and maybe she would like, uh, maybe you would like to just to, to to speak about that, because I don't want to read what you have written. You are the the better person to 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 voice what you know. Hello, I could also leave the floor to Maria Elena or Laura. Um, I would just try to summarize because 
if you record, at least you have also the chat recorded, then you know about our ideas. I think one of the uh, additional issues that you haven't discussed among those we already exchanged about in our small group as well is the idea of superficiality that a lot of people at different age levels uh, tendentially today are very short-term oriented. So people, even if they travel, even we talked even about students who go for exchanges in many very uh, exotic destinations, they should learn something or they should have learned something. And we still are surprised with all the globalization in the last 30 years that there's few in-depth knowledge. And so yeah. um, I think time is money is a paradox for the business world. Don't give people the time. And I mean, I found this very interesting that Patty mentioned that as well. I suppose, Patty, you're very often integrated into a cross-cultural coaching or training when there are already problems. Why yes. don't the companies don't invest before there are problems? Because you could be even more efficient, you know, yeah, exactly. um, to, prepare, say we... to prepare yeah. and not only be the firefighting person. Yeah. And, and the focus it is so much on, it is on reparation rather than preparation. And it is so short-sighted. And when I, most of the clients that I work with, I work with a lot of relocation companies and, you know, and, and a lot of their clients, uh, you know, I'm subcontracted by them to, to provide cultural training. And um, that's the majority of my work. And so many of them don't, they, they're offered it and they don't take it. And they're like, oh, no, you know, no. or they're given. I don't have time, or there are some uh, more urgent yeah, things to or, do, or so. Or yeah, they're given a lump sum, and one of the things that they can choose to spend it on is cultural training, or you know, they'll thanks, mm. they'll buy a new sofa, or you know, mm. um, I, I don't know how we get over that. I mean, I think we have and to start in primary school, huh? Yeah, to develop mm -hmm. general so, curiosity sorry, of children for understanding any kind of otherness or difference, to be more tolerant, to be more open to those differences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, the teacher that who you know allowed when I was eight, and the teacher who allowed those other students to do that, really is intolerable. You know that 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 could have been a great lesson for those eight-year-old students back then. So. So I, I think we started to complain a little bit about the companies and young people or other people who travel to other countries without reading a lot. And uh, I, I think that it would be better to, to be back on the track with, you know, all our best practices and uh, wonderful yeah. uh, advice, <laughs> pieces of advice, yeah. how to, yeah, how to improve the situation and make it better. Maria yeah. Lena has got a hand raised. Could Thank you. you. Uh, I just only wanted to say that I think it, at the nursery school, we should start. And once my children were uh, interviewed and they are half Colombian, half German, I come from Colombia, my husband is German. And then I remember they answered, um, our superpower is to see one thing from many perspectives. And it's, for them, this this answer was very natural. And I thought, oh, we have to answer. And this, that the point that many things are natural, not that you have to. Because at the university, for example, I see that um, we offer intercultural trainings or transcultural trainings, and these are not mandatory. And sometimes we have maybe five people, not more. And in, in the, um, for example, in um, economics, you have the, the um, signatures, um, um, intercultural management, Ivy America intercultural management, and these all are mandatories. And for the students have to do this, they do. But um, I think it would be great if we could start from the very beginning in a very natural way. Not to now we have this, this um, we have one hour intercultural competence training. No just in a very natural way. But for this, we need that the teachers, that they so, get this education during the, the, their, their studies at the university. Because I have already finished, uh, so last month I, I finished uh, another master's degree in intercultural education. And that's the point that many universities here in Germany they talk about this, but we don't have really um, how can I say, 
points that say we have or we need this as an elementary part at school. So it comes back to this point about it not being mandatory and they're not being mandatory for, for anyone. And um, so one thing I think that we can do and which I do is if anyone asks me to give a talk about this, you know, it's usually not paid, but a school group or something like that, I'll go along and do it because it is up to us who have, if you like, we've already seen the light, but it's to 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 sort of talk to others about the the the, the rewards to be gained from being more culturally intelligent, and so maybe that is something that we could also. Well, I will actually look for opportunities to do that, just to help spread the word. Thank you, thank you very much, Maria, Lena, and Pat. Again, thank you. And we have to pause a little bit just for one minute for those who would like to leave now, we would like to announce the next DM meetup. And for those of you who would like to stay a little bit longer, and Cassie, I saw your, 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 your hand raised, and please, I, I would like you to, 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 to contribute. So just one minute now to announce the next DM meetup. And then those of you who, who, who need or who must, who want to leave, you can leave. Those of you who would like to stay a little bit longer, we can just stay for another 15 minutes to, to finalize the discussion. And of course, I'm very grateful. We are very grateful to Patty for this for organizing this great discussion. Uh, Cindy, thank you, Victoria. <laughs> so the, our next direct members meetup will be on the sixth of November at three o'clock in the afternoon. And our speaker is Cynthia Milani. She is a neuroanthropologist, and the title of her presentation is the neuroscience of culture. So that should be a very interesting discussion with her. And I hope you can make it. And I hope to see you then. The Neuroscience of Culture on the 6th of November at 3 p.m. And there will be an announcement coming out yes. a couple of weeks later. Uh, now, those of you who, who, who need to go, uh, thank you very much for participating in this uh, wonderful uh, DM meetup today. And we've got another 10 to 15 minutes to stay longer to discuss. And Kasa, please, the floor is yours. Don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> just shortly. Um, it was very small, but very pra practical thing I wanted to share because many of you have said that there is this uh, requirement. People think that there is a need, but <laughs> actually we know it's not necessary, but they want to have their statistics. They want to have their graphs of Steve, the mayor, Trump and ours. doesn't matter which one. And they really, really to, trying to make their notes when they see those graphs. Uh, and they like lists, like laundry lists, you said, Patty, exactly. Do's and don'ts. And talking about what impacts our perception of the word and how we see the word profession. Yes, indeed, I see this big need for graph statistics uh, in engineers groups, especially IT people. Um, and I want to somehow to meet this requirement, even if I don't regard it as a deep need, but they maybe have this deep need of uh, quantitative data to be able maybe from this point to go further. So sometimes I show some statistics, but I really, really show them also some rules of the statistics. For example, the ones that say that the diversity in the group is always bigger than uh, average difference between the groups. And it's like a mind opening when you realize this, that they in their group may have big, bigger differences. And then um, I say, I will not give you any do's and don'ts what you can do in Sweden or in India or <laughs> in Great Britain, uh, but I can give you actually list of do's and don'ts regarding what is a good or best practice when you are working internationally with people that are diverse, with people that maybe are different from you or have different preferences. And it could be things like you mentioned, for example, uh, don't uh don't jump into conclusion if you feel uh uncertain or do 
look for something that unites for something that you have in common and it could be a list but list that is like more uh, generic so to say and not giving concrete examples as the only ones that you can use in a certain situation yeah i i often tell people to keep their eyes and their ears open and their mouth shut so <laughs> you can add that to your list <laughs> And like the conversation oh, started yeah. with a uh, with a question which you you gave so very very well. Mm. How do we know that we are prepared? Uh, and I think I think actually the moment we start thinking we're prepared, we're not. And I think it's it's having that ability to say, ah, this is going to be ambiguity. I'm not going to feel comfortable. Yeah. And then you know, Patty, your, your words are absolutely right. And this is one of the bits of advice I give to all of us. That are moving around whether they're graduates on placement in different countries or senior leaders moving to take over part of our organization it's you know spend time looking you know watch see what goes on and yeah. um and be be open to observe and i think that's also important because the danger is and, and cassia is right you know people people ask for lists and that's great let's have a list for northern india middle india eastern india southern india western yeah. india um, let's have a list for Saudi Arabia, for, you know, sort of uh, Dubai, for UAE. I mean, you know, we, we can't do that. And I think we have to encourage people to to stop wanting to be fed and actually say, you're going to be integrated because you're going to learn while you're there if you want to learn. And I think that for me is the big thing. It's don't think you're prepared. Otherwise, you go in really with closed eyes and with a closed mindset. But let's go in there. I have a privilege. I've got to be honest. I have a great privilege because I work within a company. And so I do take a little bit of umbrage at the conversation that went on earlier on about organizations. Mine is a great organization. It has me. And, oh, yours and has my is role. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, one of the things I have the privilege of is then getting in touch with somebody. How's it going in your new culture? How's it going in that environment? Are you learning? Now, I have that privilege and I appreciate Having also been on the other side of it as an independent consultant, that's not always easy because you're right. Companies perhaps don't want to pay for that side of the the registered the regular contact. But I think for me, it is that ability to go and have that conversation. What have you now learned? Now you're in the culture, and I think that's the integration part of it. And yeah, then, and then and then and then we have to allow people uh, not to learn because some people just don't want to be to get integrated. We should remember about that as well. And I see Anchor has got uh, the hand. Patty, would you like to comment on, on what, what Steve said? Yeah, oh, I just, yeah. yeah I just, just quickly to, to respond to what Steve said. Um, I, I think that is also an issue as the lack of follow-up. So again, what I do is a build in a sort of, yes, we do this cultural training, um, but let's say there's eight hours. So I'm going to do six hours of cultural training, and then we're going to have two hours up our sleeves to check in again in two and four months or whatever, and to review what you've learned, you know, what issues have arisen. And um, and people are like, oh, oh, that makes it really messy. I'm like, that's okay, you know, I'll I'll keep the timetable, I'll keep the diary, you know, it's not gonna cost you any more, it's just gonna make the training more effective. So. I think there's a great opportunity for, you know, people, many people that are independent consultants in this, to offer can offer cultural coaching and i think that's a real a real benefit and it would benefit the people that get it too yeah thank you steve and anchor and then lou and then i, I think that we have to to close up the discussion after these two comments anchor i i have the start in mind of how to begin some of these trainings and to prevent us from from our customers our students to want to hear the do's and don'ts list I often start with things like questions like, which culture are you interested in? And people go South Asia, Korea, India, they'd name all these. And I said, I didn't ask you about nationality. So let's talk about what culture is, number one. Then um, I also go into how many countries are there in this world? And people sometimes even their you know, lack of knowledge. Okay, so 190 plus UN acknowledged uh, nations. And I said, is this it? Do we have 192 languages? No, we have between six and 7,000. 7, That's the next like, whoa, well, how many languages? And then deduct from that, how many 
di cultural differences. And do you expect me to talk to you today about between 200 and 7,000 different <laughs> cultures and do's and don'ts I won't but I can sensitize you is that the right word I can make you sensitive <laughs> I can uh, show you the different some of the different perspectives uh, we can talk about what what your awareness at this point is and we need to we can start opening that up wider that window so and oftentimes and that's the last sentence um, for me is also that I say we might go out of this workshop with more questions than answers. And that's true for me sometimes too. So this is this is where we go into ambiguity. This is where we go into complexity of the issue. There are no simple answers. And that is something we have to live with. And that's what we have to learn to live with that. Yeah. Thank you, Anker. Luan? Um, yeah. Um... It's it's always really interesting for me when I look in internet or LinkedIn, whatever. Um, there's a lot of talk about working with companies and usually it's the higher echelons in the company about intercultural communications and, and diversity. Um, personally, one of my main concerns is the general public. Um, being in Germany, like many some of, of you are, um, in many other countries, but the the influx of, of people from other countries has been and is going to be um, overwhelming. And there's, I feel like there's such a need for the average citizen, the average child, the average parent to have more knowledge about the kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, I think it's so important for the, um, the, the normal migrant coming in or and the refugees to also have this general information because um, I've looked so, so often in different websites <clears throat> for you know who's offering truly intercultural um, coaching or training for the refugees, knowing what it means to have this culture shock, knowing knowing all the emotions that they're going through and how they're normal. So if anybody can give me any help. Um, and in, in, in pushing that kind of thing or finding out more information that really is more available to the general public, I would really appreciate it. What kind of information are you looking for once again, Andrew? Um, initially, I think my key bit of information is information for especially refugees and, and culture shock. I mean, a lot of them don't know what they're experiencing and that it's to a point it's, it's normal and how to deal with it. And for example, I work with a a, Frauen, um, uh, a woman standing group with, it's a group of, of they match refugees with um, German women. And these are normal women. They're not working in big companies and they they don't have that knowledge about culture shock or about what the differences are in cultures or how long things can take or whatever. And I think it would make everyone feel a little bit more comfortable about where they are in this moment and to be able to go forward more productively if they had that information. All right. So if I got you right, so you're looking for the information that would actually help you to work with a refugee and uh, who are facing the cultural shock, yeah? But actually, the the, yeah, the only difference, so people usually just experience cultural shock, but the, the refugee, that's these other people with traumas. So that's, you have to combine the knowledge yeah, about no. trauma and about, exactly. <laughs> and about the culture shock. Uh, sorry, so, um, Sahe, uh, if you if you just can spend sorry. one 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 minute okay. because I would like to give the floor to Patty to, to Patty because she would like okay. to, to to say something at the end I think I mean the closing remarks just one yeah. one minute for you. Okay, sorry. I I would love to connect with you, Luann. Um, I'm also American, living in Germany. I went through an integration course in Germany. It was really interesting. Not 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 really what I thought it would be. <laughs> um, having gone through an integration course as an as a foreigner, right? Um, I, I had a lot of sort of different, I don't know, I, I got a lot of different things out of it, I guess, uh, good and bad. 
Um, so yes, I totally agree with you about the general public. Um, but I think in our group, I just wanted to say we really need to talk about balance, openness, curiosity, communication, and also it's not always on them or the individual. It's it's a two way street. So that's my two cents, and I messaged you directly, Luann. So all right, hope to connect. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's great to see that we are making the the connections now and the partnerships. Probably it will work. Patty, uh, first of all, thank you very much for today's uh, for today. And yours are the closing remarks. Uh, thank you. My my pleasure. Thanks for having me, and thank you all for for joining in. I, it, it, obviously, I'm not alone in my in feeling frustrated at where we're at. Uh, I, I know that. Um, so um, yeah, I would just remind everyone to to take every opportunity that. Um, uh, that they can to to speak to people who are uh, not always um, resistant, but just uninformed, just unaware, um, which is, I mean, I do come across some people who are just like, yeah, I know about it, but I don't want it. And, and I kind of put them in the same bucket as the people who, uh, you know, I just don't feel that there are any rewards. But but more often it's put like, oh, I had no idea something like that existed. And it, there is an opportunity to say, well, you know, would you be interested in, in just a kind of lunch and learn? I could do a sort of half hour webinar for your staff on, on this. Um, it all gets people talking. It gets people thinking, you know, if we pay it forward, you know, maybe it will come back and, you know, we might get some work out of it as well. Um, so, um, I, you know, I'm sure we are all doing what we can, but maybe there's a bit more that we can do as well. So, um, well, I hope to, to see some of you at, at CETA in Lille next year and um, and uh, and on another chat. And thank you all for being here. So. Thank you very much, everyone. See okay. you soon. Thank Bye. you once again, Patty, for sharing the experience and also for, you know, posting some good questions for us to leave and to think over them. <laughs> Good. All right. Thanks. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye.